within. So over to Sean Holden, who's lead product designer at Open Dialogue. And before you kickstart, I just want to remind everybody that we are actually partnering in with Open Dialogue. Open Dialogue has, um, has created GSA's ESG digital companion. So, um, so done some great work for the GSA. Cool. Right, over to you, Sean. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's been lovely to meet and greet lots of you. Um, today, I'd just like to uh, spend a little bit of time chatting to you about our accessibility journey that we've undertaken recently at Open Dialogue. Uh, a bit of a spoiler alert from Kerry, but I'll, go, I'll do this bit anyway. That's not a problem. Um, I'm a lead product designer at Open Dialogue. I have been in design for the past 20 years. I've got 20 years of experience with UX design, product design, uh, accessibility, service design, all sorts of things where you build and you answer um, a, a problem statement with an output. For those of you who don't know Open Dialogue, we are a responsible software company who build conversational AI tools, and we believe that the products and services that we build should be built by a diverse range of people, they should be inclusive and accessible to as many people as possible. So, I'd just like to start with uh, a quote from renowned um, comedian and journalist uh, Stella Young. Uh, I won't read it out, but I wanted to start with this because I feel like it really, it's such a poignant quote because it really helps to kind of frame the social um, perception that I feel many businesses and organizations still have around things like accessibility, which is, is a bit of an afterthought sometimes. I think there are definitely organizations that do this better, like central government, local authority, but for many businesses, it's often something that they only think about when they get a slap on the wrist. So, did you know one in five users have a disability? So if we were to look at everybody in this room now, pretty much, if everybody in this room went through a digital experience, almost all of the people on this side of the room would have some form of visual, auditory, motor, or cognitive condition, which meant how they experienced a digital product or piece of technology would be very different from everybody else. Just to give you an example of what that looks like, uh, someone with uh, impaired vision might use a screen reader, which is a piece of software that announces um, the content that it can see within a digital product to the user. They may use a braille keyboard, so that they've got a tactile uh, response back to what they can read and see. And they may even use something like a screen magnifier because they need to see content at a much larger size than um, most users. Thinking about motor difficulties, uh, someone might use a special mouse that's been made bespoke for the condition that they have. Or they may use uh, an emulator of some description to experience a digital product, such as on-screen keyboard. However you look at it, 20% of users is actually a substantial portion um, of your potential audience. And if you think about the funnel of users coming to your digital products and those that end up kind of going all the way through the purchase consideration cycle to become loyal uh, to your brand and your business, that 20% becomes even more important the longer and longer that funnel goes on. In 2018, accessibility regulations were introduced to ensure that public sector digital products are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. These four pillars are incredibly important because they form the basis of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which um, were first published way back in 1995. Most of you probably know those as WACAG um, because it's often abbreviated. Um, within the WACAG uh, guidelines, there are three levels of accessibility criteria. The first one is A. The second one is AA, which is the globally accepted um, standard. And then the last one is AAA, which in all my experience, I've only seen one digital product that has been AAA certified, which was the RNIB, the Royal National Institute for the Blind Association website. AAA is incredibly difficult to go for, which is why many organizations, including the uh, like central local government, go for AA accreditation. At the moment, AA 2.1 is the current standard and has been for some years. Um, and it just so happens that this year we're in luck because in October, AA 2.2 becomes the most up-to-date uh, level of compliance regulation, which comes into effect later this year. 
So to just quickly touch on these, uh, the first pillar within web content accessibility is perceivable. So this typically covers things like um, color contrast in your content, so a user can uh, determine whether they're looking at a piece of text or a background element. It could cover things like buttons. It could cover all sorts of things within a web page. That also means uh, things like typography and weights. If you've got a really light, delicate font, someone with a visual impairment is going to really struggle to read that. And if it's a really small size, they're just going to disengage and leave your product. Last couple of things, um, this all co also covers, th covers things like hierarchical titles. So someone who's using assistive technology when they're presented with a, with a digital product, when they see the different titles of content on your product, they have to be in a way that, in, a, in an alignment that makes sense to those users. So they can't see a small title, then a large title, then a small title, then a large title, because from their point of view, they have no idea what they're reading. It puts all their content in the complete wrong order. The second pillar is operable. So this covers things like responsive uh, design. So users should be able to use your digital products on any device using any assistive technology that they prefer. That, whether that's their smartphone, whether that's their tablet, desktop computer, a computer at a local library, or something that's hooked up to their assistive technology, such as their own kind of bespoke mouse. This also covers uh, things like keyboard uh, navigation. So many users actually interact with a website without using um, a touch screen on a smartphone or um, any other kind of um, supportive technology. Actually, they, also, they just use keyboard navigation. So typically, they'll use tab, arrow keys, spacebar, and enter to just move around your product. So your products should be completely navigatable and usable using only a keyboard. And then last thing, um, with operable screen reader support. So as they're going through your content, if they're unable to see or read it, it needs to be possible for that content to be announced to them. Next, we've got understandable. So this probably sounds like a bit of an obvious one, but you'd be surprised how many times I have experienced uh, a failure under this particular pillar. Um, and this is often referring to things like a logical content ordering. So if you think about an e-commerce experience where you buy a product, you wouldn't have the buy button first. You would have about the product, images of the product, price of the product, buy now, because that's the logical order in how we think as human beings. That's a really basic example to just give you, but just so that you can kind of um, come on the journey with me and understand this from um, the perspective of this pillar of accessibility. If you get this wrong and people don't understand and they're using a piece of assistive technology, there's no way they can fully engage with you as a business because they don't know what's going on. This also covers things like uh, plain English content. So using text that has a lower reading age, making sure that there's no spurious or unusual words that commonly people wouldn't understand. And then the last thing on this list um, is navigation support that helps to orientate and direct users. I'm sure you can all agree that you've used a digital product where you've got completely lost in it because the navigation structure doesn't make sense. You've got no idea where you are, where you were, or how to get back to where you wanted to be in the first place. Um, so this is a really, really crucial part um, of um, this particular pillar. And then the last one, digital products should be compatible with a wide range of technology because we all browse in a different way. We've got iPhone, we've got Android users, we've got PC, we've got Mac. We've got all sorts of different pieces of technology. We've got some people that use JAWS, which is a uh, piece of software particularly important for those users who suffer from cognitive issues because it helps them to navigate a product, find what they're looking for. So as part of our accessibility journey, um, we kind of started with um, the regulated industry of healthcare because it's a really, really important um, industry for us. Um, we spent some time kind of conducting um, some audits to understand, well, what does this look like for us in terms of what the actual actionable outputs need to be? What outcomes do we want to achieve? What work do we have to do? And for anybody else curious or thinking about going on a similar journey, I thought I would just outline uh, the usual suspects that typically come up on projects similarly to this. So number one, the f one, number one failure I see all day, every day, I've seen it 10 times today, uh, color contrast. Um, by default, it should be four to five to one for AA. Um, if you need a little bit more context on what that means, feel free to ask someone within the design team, they'll be able to tell you what that means. But um, quite often, this is the number one failure that I always see. 
Uh, the next is uh, ARIA labels. So this might not be a term that you're familiar with, but when someone's using assistive technology, ARIA labels are a small attribute value in the code that tell users what the piece of content is that they're looking at. So for a header, it would say Sean's presentation, for example. Next, um, keyboard navigation. Again, common offender that I see. Um, it's closely followed by WC3 validation, which is a tool that checks the validity and markup of your code. Although it's quite a technical thing, it's super important. Not only is it good for people, it's also good for planet, because if you pass WC3 validation, the amount of information you're taking from a data center is lower, because how you've coded your digital product is better. So it's good for people, because they can use it, and good for planet, because it saves on energy. Next, uh, font size and format. So although there's not any strict guidelines on font sizes that you should use, the generally recommended smallest sizes are equivalent to 16 pixels for most content, 14 pixels for any other supporting content. So for example, if you had a date stamp, that would probably be okay to be 14. If you had a piece of paragraph text within a conversational um, chatbot, that needs to be 16 so that a user can kind of read that and understand. I won't go through all these additional ones here um, in too great a detail, but just to think again about these usual suspects that we see typically on project to project. Uh, focus state, so you may have seen this when you're navigating for a product, you get a little highlight box around the element that you're currently looking at. Again, this is incredibly important because it helps people that use assistive technology to know where they are within that digital product. Uh, next, uh, button styles. So again, my, most people get the text right, but then they forget that a button has text in it and that has to meet color contrast ratios. So therefore, they're non-compliant. That's a failure. Last couple of things, uh, heading structure. I've kind of touched upon this a little bit more, but again, it's something that I see quite often that we see a large title, then a small title, and then another large title, which sometimes doesn't make sense in how you logically structure your content. And then the last couple of bits and pieces, I'll just quickly whisper this. So alt tags, if a user has a visual impairment and they see an image on a page, how are they supposed to know what the image content is if it doesn't use alt tags? And alt tags is probably one of the first things I ever learned about the internet back in the days of like Lycos in 1998, 1999. And I'm still shocked today to see that there's still instances where these are not in use. Uh, the last couple are mainly tech. Um, but some people prefer to use a text-only browser so they don't get any of the kind of nice, shiny user interface elements. They just get the text information. If you want to be compliant, you have to make sure that you offer that as a solution. There has to be support for JavaScript. Some um, users who use things like assistive technology will turn JavaScript off because it makes browsing easier for them. So if you do have a service that relies on JavaScript, it's your duty to, to kind of tell the user if you turn JavaScript on, you can use our experience and much, much more. So I've talked a lot about all the different things that we looked at, um, and I'm gonna kind of give you a quick once over of here's one we made earlier. So on the left, we had the original uh, web chat product, which is what we uh, kind of build and sell uh, at enterprise level. And on the right are all the changes that we made. So I know that not everybody is a designer and not everybody looks for the same things that I look for. So I've just made it easier to understand where we've made changes. You may think they're super subtle, but these changes are so important to users. It's the difference between someone being able to interact with your content and just completely disengaging, not being able to complete a task. You know, Some of the tasks, especially within regulated industries, are so important. It could be booking an appointment for a cancer treatment. It could be finding a car parking space to go and see a loved one. This is so important. Um, but to just quickly go from top to bottom, uh, if we compare the left to the right, we've adjusted our out-the-box styling so that any clients that we kind of sell this product to, out-the-box works straight away. Everything is up to the color contrast levels of AA compliance. Uh, we've also adjusted some of the type styles, and we've also thought about our global UI so that it's as keyboard navigationable as possible, easy, assistive, so that regardless of how you browse, you can interact with our product. So just thinking about um, doing, the, doing what's right, um, we could have just stopped there and just made sure that our product was accessible, but we wanted to go a little bit further. So um, we uh, provide a Gitbook uh, documentation for all of our clients on how they set up their content, how they can build conversations, and how they can uh, make the most of the software and the, um, the AI within our product. 
To complement that, we've also created a series of uh, documentation that goes through the sort of accessible do's and don'ts. So what you're seeing here is a perfect illustration of uh, color contrast, which is my bugbear, as you've probably guessed by now. So this is how it should look, and this is what you need to do. And then on the right, don't do this, basically. I'm not expecting everyone to be a designer, but hopefully these kinds of guides are supportive enough to get you going as a client so that you can make the most informed decisions yourself and keep that autonomy within the business. But we can go even further than that. Um, we wanted to also inspire other organizations because when you look at the uh, kind of guidelines that are available in terms of WACAG and accessibility, there's a lot of mention towards products and websites, but actually, in advice within the AI technology chatbot space is pretty limited. Um, it actually took us a long time to kind of understand and figure out, well, I can understand this level of compliance, but what does that mean for an AI chatbot company? Um, so as part of that inspiration, um, we took a steer from um, inclusive design um, and provided some additional documentation. I don't know if anybody's in familiar with inclusive design, but it's this premise of solve for one and extend to many. So to give you an example of what that might look like, someone born with one arm will have the same experience using a digital product as a mother carrying a child or someone who has a circumstantial injury where at the moment they've got their arm in a sling. By providing a solution that works for someone with one arm in general as a term, we can extend that solution uh, to those who have situational or circumstantial needs. And again, if you think about it, it's that idea of solve for one and extend to many. So this is also something that we've provided as part of our free, open, publicly available documentation to inspire other similar organizations to think about inclusive design in their process and as, as an organization so that we can improve the products, services we uh, provide to people. So just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, I just I can't emphasize how important this slide is, which is everyone within a team is responsible for making a product accessible. Accessibility is not an individual responsibility. Everyone in the team is responsible. We are witnessing a moment of change. And this work isn't just about completing a checklist and making sure that you're compliant to a specific standard. It's about making a commitment to be different from here onwards and making sure that Okay, we've updated our current product to make sure that that's accessible, but every time we make new features and new developments, they also need to be accessible. They also need to be inclusive. So, yeah, um, it just informs how we work, the choices we make when we design um, and develop and release to make sure that we are just continually perpetuating that idea of making products that are inclusive and accessible for as many people as possible. Okay, so I've been really cruel got a quick quiz and you can just quickly put your hand up if you feel like you know the answer but first one what year were the first WACAG guidelines published yes pardon correct I'd give you a point but um, I don't have a scorecard so just take this take this make-believe point <laughs> number two what percentage of people live with a disability 20%. One in five, thank you. I think someone at the back said 20% as well, well done. Next, how many pillars of accessibility are there? Four. Correct, four. What level of, of compliance did Open Dialog achieve with our web chat product? Triple A. Correct, that's two for two. <laughs> and then the last one, when does WACAG 2.2 come into effect? October. Congratulations. Cool. Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you to all the speakers today. Um, I've had an absolute pleasure meeting and listening to all of your different perspectives on your business. Thank you for giving me the past 15, 20 minutes of time. Um, do I have time for any questions or do we need to move on? Yeah, time for one quick question. One quick anybody question, anybody? Quick question? I'm just going to say that was really good. I really had a lot. Thank you. No problem. It's been a pleasure. It's better to have that sort of compliment than the question, maybe. So, yeah. yeah. No, I did too. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. And um, I guess I've got a question for you. How bad was my deck? How bad was... <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to give you a grade A to C or 0 to 100? Just whisper it to me later. No. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's brilliant.